This is a, a talk that's focused on the, the field of liquid biopsy, uh, and in particular, the use of exosomes to enable liquid biopsy. So this is a fairly new field. It was uh, something I stumbled onto uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago now, um, when I was working on actually tumor stem cells um, in the area of uh, brain cancer, and saw that these uh, cells were blebbing off these vesicles into the surrounding. And uh, the, the real discovery was here to find that these vesicles contained RNA from the cell itself. And since these RNA molecules are then released into the, the biofluids, you could potentially use it as a diagnostics. And uh, this is something that uh, led to the start of the company Exosome Diagnostics, where I now work as uh, Chief Scientific Officer. And that's why I have this disclosure slide. Uh, we have uh, now worked in a variety of different cancers, but happy to say that uh, one of the uh, world's first exosome-based tests are available. Uh, it's uh, in uh, prostate cancer. We also have one uh, in lung cancer. But to start off a little bit, uh, there is a change in the way for medicine. Um, and that is that we're moving away more and more from this morphological diagnosis and moving into a molecular diagnosis, looking at certain pathways or mutations in the tumors to define what type of treatment and, and outcome the patient would have. And as you know, tissue is an issue. Uh, there is heterogeneity. Sometimes there's no way of actually getting to the tissue. It can be some uh, patients, some tumor types. It's hard to access the, the tumor tissue. So the field is actively looking at this uh, liquid biopsy space to fill in that gap. And this is a less invasive approach that enables you to do longitudinal monitoring of your patients so that you can uh, um, get the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. Because when you think about a biopsy, it's just a fixed time point that you're looking at. And tumors are extremely dynamic. Uh, it's known as a little, as little as three to four months after initiation of treatment, the dominant phenotype and genotype of the tumor can change. Uh, so this has sparked this liquid biopsy gold rush that uh, has been dominated by circulating tumor cells, cell-free DNA or cell-free tumor DNA, and now also exosomes. So what is an exosome? So I mentioned that these are sort of blebs that are coming off of, of tumor cells. I have this little schematic that illustrates the pathways that generate these vesicles. Let's see if I can find a... Here you go. So the most classical pathway for exosome release is through the multivesicular body. So this is the, uh, a schematic image of the cell where you have formation of these endosomes and then inward budding into these endosomes forming multiluminal vesicles or multivesicular bodies. These small vesicles here, when they are formed, take up um, a part of the cytoplasm of the cell. So you get package of RNA and proteins in these small vesicles. And then this multivesicular body is reshuttled back to the plasma membrane where they are released to the surrounding. And uh, since you have two fusion events happening here, the orientation of the lipid membrane is actually the same as on the donor cell, which gives you also an opportunity to do enrichment and understanding what the, the source of the vesicle was. Another way of a vesicle release is actually through the direct budding pathway. So that, that is very similar to how our retrovirus is leaving the cell. And, 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 and budding off like this. Once the vesicle have left the cell, there's no way of knowing how it was formed. There are no molecular signatures or targets uh, known today that will differentiate different release mechanisms. And different groups and different papers, when you look in this field, call these vesicles different things. They're called exosomes, microvesicles, oncosomes, microparticles. And they, have, uh, they all have a little bit different definitions of how these vesicles are, um, should be isolated and defined. But um, when I talk about exosomes, it's the general term for any extracellular vesicle. 
What's so fascinating by these, uh, with these exosomes is that they are, uh, we have now shown that these are released as a mean, uh, means of intercellular communication. So up until that discovery, it was only known, so intercellular communication was only known to happen through secreted proteins and secreted factors. Um, however, now we have a way for cells to communicate with each other through molecules that are not normally secreted, such as intracellular proteins and RNA. And that's a much more powerful intercellular communication uh, mechanism. So these exosomes are released by basically all cells into the biofluids. They're produced by eukaryotic cells as well as prokaryotic cells, but with different mechanisms. And they do play a role in both health and disease. So tumor exosomes, when these are released, they, they are a little bit malicious because we've shown that tumor exosomes can stimulate tumor cell growth. They can also inhibit immune cells. They're very immunosuppressive. They can also stimulate angiogenesis. Um, and when, when you look at these cells, it's really a heterogeneous mix of, of, of or when you look at the vesicles, it's a heterogeneous um, mix of, of, of vesicles. Uh, this illustrates that phenomenon. This is a primary glioblastoma cell imaged by scanning electron microscopy. And you zoom in on this area of the cell, you see these vesicles coming off of the plasma membrane. If you isolate the vesicles and you do a, more of a close-up with transmission EM, you can see that there are very small vesicles, there are a little bit larger vesicles, and the contents seem to be very heterogeneous too. You have electron-dense ones and, and more hollow vesicles. But the absolute majority of these vesicles are between 50 and 200 nanometers in diameter. So similar in size as a retrovirus particle, basically. Uh, if you do cryo-EM, you can see clearly that uh, they have a, they're encapsulated by a dip, double lipid membrane, and in some cases, even multiple vesicles. So you have vesicles within vesicles in these uh, multilamellar structures. It's known that uh, uh, stem cells, and especially tumor stem cells, also release these exosomes, but they also seem to release a larger type of vesicle that you don't need an electron microscope to see. You can actually see these vesicles with a normal microscope, a bright field microscope. Um, here we have tumor stem cells uh, stained with a CD133 uh, stem cell marker, and you can see the blebs coming off of these cells. Um, so these are very, a very heterogeneous mix of vesicles that you can isolate from plasma. And the exosomes are a treasure trove for biomarkers for this reason. So what we have shown over the years is that they contain basically all of the transcriptome. You find all of the mRNAs in there, the microRNAs, the non-coding RNAs, as well as very interesting proteins. You've got the MMPs, you've got angiogenic proteins, you've got tumor-specific proteins. Uh, and in the case of other diseases, like neurodegenerative diseases, they package uh, tau protein, alpha-synuclein protein, and even prion proteins. And these vesicles are known to not only be released in the environment into the biofluid, but can also actually traverse in tissue and move through, uh, throughout tissue and deliver uh, some of these pathogenic proteins from one area of the brain to another. When you think of these exosomes, they're almost like a mini version of the cell, <laughs> where you got the protein markers on the surface that are similar in characteristic or similar in orientation um, uh, and configuration as on the donor cell. However, the abundance of these vesicles are very different than cells or circulating tumor cells, for example. A single tumor cell can release over 20,000 of these vesicles per day into the surrounding. And all of these contain uh, the transcriptome and proteins. So a lot, uh, some people have, have equated this with that the, the, these vesicles are small messages being sent, almost like a Twitter message. So each tumor cell will send about 20,000 of these Twitter messages to the surrounding every day with information, reprogramming stromal cells and immune cells and, and, and tumor cells. 
But for us, for a diagnostic perspective, um, we're not so much interested in what they do, uh, rather what we can do with them. So uh, using the exosomes to get to the RNA content in the tumor cell is important. And we've shown that the RNA inside exosomes is incredibly stable. We can extract exosomal RNA from biobank samples that have been stored for uh, way over 10 years in the, in the freezers with no sign of degradation. So basically, if you take a plasma sample and you extract it, you see intact 18 and 28S ribosomal RNA in there, and we can do full RNA profiling of the sample. Um, it's not so easy to get to the exosomal or to the plasma RNA content with other methods than the exosome isolation. If you take a plasma sample and you just do a direct precipitation of the sample, the RNA actually becomes degraded in the process. There are, there are commercially available kits from Kyogen and others that just do direct precipitation of the RNA, but the amount of RNases in plasma actually inhibit or prevents you from getting good quality RNA out of the sample. So it's important that your isolation process is optimal. Uh, before you lyse it. Um, of course, we've done a lot of stability testing. This is just uh, an example showing you that exosomal RNA is actually stable across freeze-thaw cycles of plasma. So even if your, your, your plasma sample have been freeze-thawed multiple times, there's no degradation of the mRNA or microRNA that is packaged inside the, the vesicle. And you can also store the sample on the bench for several days. Uh, in our prostate cancer uh, test that we, we've developed, we've, we've shown stability of the exosomal RNA for several weeks. Uh, even in the clinical validation study, we allowed um, the, the urine to sit for several weeks before it processes at, at, in, in plus four. It's not something we recommend, but we know that, that the performance is still there. So up until fairly recently, the gold standard for exosome isolation has been ultracentrifugation. And in the vast majority of uh, labs, academic labs throughout the world, people are still using ultracentrifugation for, for, uh, for the isolation of exosomes. However, that has been a hurdle. So you cannot take that protocol into the clinic very easily because every ultracentrifugation protocol is different. There's a lot of technical variations in the process. So standardizing this was key for us at Exosome Diagnostics. So we've developed some kits that are commercially available and then also clinical versions of the kits that are CGMP manufactured for, for us to do uh, the, the clinical uh, studies as well as uh, uh, for the, the, the patient samples that are, are being run now as in, this, in the standard version of the tests. So we got um, basically our urine exosome kit. We got um, our Exolution EDI platform. EDI stands for Exosome de Depletion or Enrichment Platform. So I mentioned that exosomes have surface molecules or the proteins that are on the donor cell is present on the vesicles that are released from it. So you can actually use affinity purification to either enrich tumor-specific exosomes or deplete um, uh, non-relevant exosomes in case you don't have a specific marker in your tumor. Uh, we also have um, through high throughput versions of the exosome isolation platform. So the EDI platform is an interesting, um, interesting application here. So we've seen that when you do enrich for disease-specific exosomes, you increase the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, it's really been the holy grail of liquid biopsies to capture tissue or disease-specific markers from plasma. And with EDI, I think we're closer than ever before on that because when you take a plasma sample, plasmas are extremely complex liquids. They have high abundance proteins and albumin, immunoglobulins and others that actually mask signal in your sample. So when you have your complex sample, you can either do a background depletion so your signal become visible or you do positive selection, so you capture the signal out of the noise. Both applications work. We know that we can remove uh, uh, over 80% 
uh, some of the background noise with the, the enrichment platform. It's, uh, it's just an optimized, pra uh, optimized process for, for capture of these uh, vesicles. And uh, an example of when this is needed. So it's not in every case you need to use the EDI platform for, to find a biomarker. In most cases, actually, in our clinical assays, we don't need the EDI platform. We can just use the exosomes as they are. But for some targets, you can't find them unless you enrich. And you can uh, think about it as finding Waldo on the beach here. Uh, a plasma sample is extremely complex. There's a lot of stuff going on, and it's hard to find your tar low abundant target. But when you do the exosome enrichment, you limit, you minimize the complexity of the sample, and you're able to see it. An example of that is shown in the graph here. So we have an immunotherapy uh, diagnostic approach with EDI, where we pull down um, targets that are relevant for um, immunotherapy. And if you take a plasma sample and you do an ELISA with that plasma sample, take 500 microliters of plasma, you put it on an ELISA for PD-1, it's going to be below the detection level. You won't really see PD-1 at very high abundance. However, if you take that same 500 microliters of plasma and you pull down the, the immunotherapy relevant exosomes, the signal goes up. And what's interesting is that this signal exists in this whole plasma sample. It's just that you can't see it because the antibody is competing with all that other noise in your sample. The same is true for our neuro eddy. So if you want to do brain-specific uh, exosomes, if you're looking at tau in plasma or phospho tau in plasma, you can't detect it. That's why Alzheimer's disease uh, markers are often using cerebrospinal fluid. But in plasma, if you use, uh, pull down the neuronal specific exosomes, you can actually see it. So, um, to develop exosomes for biomarkers, we have to understand better what these exosomes contain, what types of RNA is in there. So, we've developed a long RNA seq platform for, for human plasma exosomes as well as urine and other. Uh, types of, of, of exosomes to identify sort of what is the total content in there. Why did we focus on a long RNA-seq here? Long RNA-seq is defined as RNA molecules, 200 nucleotides and above. Well, if you look in the literature for exosomal RNA, it's actually heavily flawed. All the papers that are out there, they are focusing on microRNAs and small RNAs. And they do the, the RNA-seq using small RNA library prep methods. And they think that that is what the exosomes contain. Uh, however, we've shown that that is absolutely not true. When you look at the papers that are out there, only about 2% or between 1 and 3% of the RNA they see with these methods are uh, long RNAs, like mRNAs. So why are we not interested in the small RNAs or, and more interested in the long mRNAs and link RNAs? Well, the clinical biomarker space is dominated by the mRNA and other long RNAs. Uh, the actionable targets are usually on the long RNAs. So we need a method that is able to interrogate these long RNAs or long RNAs. So we developed a variety of methods for, for, to get to these uh, targets, depending on what the purpose of the study is. Um, we've also developed a QC metric so that every patient sample that we run in-house have spike-ins of 92 control RNAs of different uh, quantity, different lengths, different size. So in every run we do, we have a QC metric of how well the process actually worked for that patient. And uh, when we're looking at the, the RNA content in the exosomes, we see a very different world of RNAs that have been pub than have been published uh, up until now. Uh, basically, uh, we see 20% of, uh, we, even with a low uh, 15 million read count, we see 20% uh, of the, 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 the genes, 60% of the protein coding transcripts, and 45 to 50 percent of all available transcripts in gen code. So, uh, to summarize it here, actually, I'll go to the slide. 
Um, in our standard prep that now has an input of between 500 microliters up to 2 ml, we can do it from plasma, serum, urine, or CSF. The prep can actually see the same diversity as you would see from sequencing a tissue sample. So you see the same amount of, of RNA targets as from a, a, a tissue sample. And the RNAs that we're seeing are actually covered in, in, actually the majority of the RNA is covered across the entire length of the RNA molecules. So it's not just fragments of RNA that we're seeing. We're seeing the entire thing, which is important when you're looking at, uh, at mutations across uh, uh, the length of the RNA. So now when we, uh, we know that um, there's a variety of RNA here, we can do a lot of biomarker discovery and we can do a lot of, um, uh, of things to monitor the actual um, processes in the tumor. Uh, we also wanted to see if we can use it for um, um, RNA targets that are known to, to have um, uh, diagnostic utility, like ARV7 splice variant, for example, which um, was mentioned in Howard Sewell's uh, talk. Um, ARV7 is basically a, a splice variant of the androgen receptor that has been shown to, uh, to uh, be expressed in uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer and, and generate some resistance to androgen, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, like enzalutamide and abiraterone. Uh, currently, uh, there's a lot of studies using circulating tumor cells looking at this ARV7 RNA. We've shown that we can do very similar things, but from biobanked plasma. And plasma is very much easier to work with than whole blood tubes that needs to be processed in a very specific and very quick manner. So here's just an illustration that the ARV7 can be monitored in these patients. and. Uh, CT, the ARV7 detection in these plasma samples are very similar, very well correlated to the, CT, the ARV7 detection that you see in circulating tumor cells. Um, another thing that you can do with RNA, so I'm only talking about the exosomal RNA right now. It, later in the, in the presentation I will talk about RNA as well as DNA uh, that can be used for mutation detection. But for, for RNA, where you use it for RNA uh, for, for profiling, um, we've also uh, used the exosomes to, to develop this epi prostate cancer test. Uh, Michael will also mention this test later this afternoon. But what this test is, basically it's a, it's a urine-based liquid biopsy. So you pee in a cup, it's a three-gene RNA signature, and the intended use here is for to detect uh, or avoid unnecessary biopsies and, and, and uh, uh, detect high-grade prostate cancer. So as you know, the goal has not been to detect more cancer, but actually to use this test to just prevent unnecessary biopsies in a population of, of, uh, of uh, men that are in the sort of PSA gray zone. So if you're 50 years or older and you have a PSA between two and 10, PSA is not very informative. And uh, they, this leads to a lot of um, uh, unnecessary biopsies. So this test comes in as an intermediate that, that um, uh, you can pee in a cup and we can tell you if you're likely not having prostate cancer or aggressive prostate cancer. So this is an overview of what the test looks like, basically. So at the urologist's office, you pee in a cup. There's no digital rectal exam or prostate massage needed. We, uh, you send this sample into, to, uh, it's a centralized model, so our CLIA lab where we extract the exosomes and do QRT-PCR of three genes, PCIA3, SPDF, and ERG, and calculates a score. And if your score is above the cut point, you're at a high risk for Gleason 7 or above prostate cancer. If you're below the cut point, you have a very low chance of having an aggressive prostate cancer. This test has been developed over many, many years. We've run uh, over 4,000 patients in various clinical trials to date. But what's important with this test is actually we've done two prospective 
clinical validation studies. And this is very unusual. I don't think any other test in this market space has done that. And we validated that the first, the first validation study that was published in JAMA Oncology in 2016, uh, the second validate, prospective validation that we did is identical to that one. So we're very uh, bullish and confident with the performance of the test. Um, the performance of the test is, uh, is basically standalone of the standard of care parameters and significantly better than standard of care parameters. This is the rock analysis of, of the performance of the EPI test. So, so it's uh, about 0.71 actually using the, the EPI alone. Um, to this. As a comparison, the PSA AUC is very close to the diagonal, so it's basically a coin toss of, of how the PSA performs. So at the validated cut point, the test performs with a negative predictive value of 90%. Since this test has been developed to avoid unnecessary biopsies, negative predictive value has been the focus and you still need to have a significant number of negative patients so that you're saving unnecessary biopsies. So basically, close to 37% of the patients are spared from doing an unnecessary biopsy or doing a biopsy, and you still have a, ne a negative predictive value of around 90%. Of the ones that you miss, 10% that you miss, the majority of them are Gleason 3 plus 4 with less than 3 positive cores. Uh, Michael will mention this test and go, can go into some of the more details on this. So, the other application of liquid biopsies has been to look at mutations. And uh, um, there, th this gold rush of looking at mutations is primarily on CTCs and cell-free DNA and now, now exosomes. But the problem with liquid biopsies and looking at mutations is that mutation, mutated copies in circulation, they're rare. That has been proven over and over again and is known to be the major problem with liquid biopsies. So you often get false negatives in, in this case. And when you go from, even in late stage cancer, f as many as um, uh, 20 to 40 percent of the patients don't have a copy of the circulating mutation in as much as five mils of plasma. As we go in earlier stage disease, this uh, number of patients increases, so you're missing more and more patients of that. And the problem with CTCs uh, in this study was even even uh, uh, more. It was even uh, more. So so CTCs had f even fewer copies of the mutations. So how do we solve that? The problem that cell-free DNA has so few copies of the mutations. Well, if you think about it, it the, the solution should be easy. <laughs> uh, because we know that the mutations exist in, very diff in, in different forms. So mutations happen on DNA, but they're reflected on the RNA. So you have multiple sources of the detectable mutation in plasma. So. <clears throat> Uh, looking at cell-free DNA that is leaking out through the dying process of the tumor, you can combine that with the exosomal RNA that is released from the living part of the tumor. Because cell-free DNA is by definition a dying process. If the DNA is free in circulation, you know that the cell died. If you find exosomal RNA in circulation, then you know it's an active metabolic process. It's actually coming from the living part of the tumor. So you get a double whammy here. You're increasing the copy numbers of the mutations, and you're also, at the same time, able to monitor two biological processes, the dying part of the tumor and the living part of the tumor. So with this method, you're able to get biological information as well as a higher performing test. Um, we've shown that in multiple clinical studies here, but we, this uh, slide in particular, I think, illustrates the um, the, f the fact um, nicely. So we developed a, a kit that simultaneously isolates exosomal RNA as well as cell-free DNA in one step. And we've proven that you get 
equally equal yield of the cell-free DNA with this kit. In, in this graph here, we did a, a cross cross-platform validation where the cell-free DNA only was used uh, versus the Exclusion Plus, which is our combined RNA and DNA extraction method. When you split the sample in two and you extract one with one method and the other sample with the other method, you see that the copy numbers on cell-free DNA is identical from every patient. But then you take the same sample and you add the reverse transcriptase enzyme, so you also account for the RNA molecules. You can see that in every case, these dots, so every dot represents uh, a patient, is now shifted above the diagonal. And these are, are the, the copy numbers of, of BRAF per plasma. So basically in every case you get an increased sensitivity by combining RNA and DNA, and that's sort of um, um, uh, logic. You also start to see biological phenomena. So this patient here, for example, is dominated on the RNA signal. Basically, it's got 16,000 copies of BRAF on the RNA and DNA, but only 3,000 copies on DNA alone. So this one is heavily driven by RNA uh, biology, and the ones that are closer to the diagonal are more cell-free DNA driven. So what we've shown in cohort of after cohort is that you always see this um, uh, distribution. So some patients you can detect with cell-free DNA and other, uh, other patients you really have to add the RNA for you to, to see it. And this helps you also for longitudinal studies because after you initiate treatment, the copies on cell-free DNA usually drops below detection limit. And if you combine it with RNA, you're able to actually see the, the, the fluctuations better. We've done uh, blinded studies to validate and verify this, where we had a, a pharma company uh, named Clovis. They had a clinical trial, actually, where they, uh, they wanted to test this uh, approach out, where they, they had the their, their, their non-small cell lung cancer patients that were enrolled in their uh, clinical study. They took the same plasma, split it in two, sent half off to Sysmex Synostics for beaming analysis, which they had identified was the, the absolutely most sensitive CFDNA assay for, for the EGFR targets that they were looking for. And the other half was sent to, to us for RNA and D analysis. And what we showed in the randomized cohort, we had a very high sensitivity that was actually much higher than what you achieve with cell-free tumor DNA alone. Uh, I think the, the beaming analysis had 80 to 85 percent sensitivity here. But what was really striking was that there are some patients that are known to be more challenging for liquid biopsies. So patients that don't secrete a lot of mutations on tumor DNA, like uh, lung cancer patients with intrathoracic disease, or M0 or M1A disease. Um, the history has shown uh, uh, cell-free DNA only has about 15 percent sensitivity in this disease population. Beaming did pretty good, actually. They came up with a 26 percent sensitivity in this population. However, with the RNA plus DNA assay, we had a 74 percent sensitivity. So that's really where you get added benefit. So the reason for this is that um, if you have late stage cancers where you already have a thousand copies of the mutation per plasma, adding the RNA will give you 5,000 or 10,000 copies of the mutation per plasma. It doesn't change the, the sensitivity, it just changes your, yeah, the numbers. We've also uh, done a head to head study um, uh, against the Roche Cobas EGFR mutation test. So, this is the only FDA approved liquid biopsy test for EGFR mutations. Uh, the Cobas test has a 58% sensitivity at an 80% specificity. Uh, the RNA plus DNA assay has a 92% sensitivity at an um, uh, nine, 89% specificity, which is quite remarkably higher. Um, and in a collaboration with MD Anderson, we've also shown that looking at the exosomal RNA plus DNA actually correlates better to treatment outcome than cell-free DNA alone, which is quite remarkable. 
So to sum up, I just want to say that, that, that the liquid biopsy is really uh, an interesting field where, where cell-free DNA, CTCs, they all have its niche, but being able to monitor the RNA as well enables you to do uh, many things that you can't do with other assays. So you can work out of biobank plasma, urine samples, and, and, and do RNA profiling to really understand what the, the, the mechanisms in the cell, in the tumor cells are, what is going up and what is going down uh, when you're uh, treating your patients. Uh, it also enables you to do splice variant analyses and other things that you can't do on DNA alone. And you also enables applications outside of oncology, which is quite uh, interesting because we've shown very uh, interesting data in the, in the area of neurodegenerative diseases as well as transplant rejection and, and, and others. Thank you.